Isn't that wonderful? We have our own resident James Taylor with us, Mr. Ben Rosenbush. Can we say thank you to him again? Thank you to the band. Oh, the perfect song. The perfect song to launch us this morning. We're going to be talking together about friendship. My name is Jen Alexander, and I'm so excited that I get to speak about friendship because friendship matters to me. Friendship matters to me, and I think that it matters to every single person in this room. Friendship matters to women and to men, to single people, to married people, teenagers, children, even dogs. It matters. Friendship matters. And so we are going to open up the Friendship app together this morning. Before we do, I want to take a moment just to greet our online audience wherever and whenever you are joining us. We are glad that you are here. We have been in this series, Ryan mentioned, in the book of Proverbs. It's been a terrific series. I hope that you have been keeping up because it has been an extremely life-applicable series as the book of Proverbs is an extremely life-applicable book. We have been growing together in wisdom this summer, and I think that we have grown tremendously, and we're going to put kind of a capper on this series this morning by growing in wisdom in the area of friendship. The book of Proverbs has much to say about friendship, and so we're going to dive right in. All right, we're going to dive right in. Our theme verse this morning comes out of Proverbs. It's going to go up on the screens. You can read it with me. I'll read it out loud, and then we'll read it together. It says, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. All right, let's read this out loud together. It is our theme verse for this morning. Here we go. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and and get in trouble, right? This is very pointed, in some ways, very intuitive. But basically, what this verse says to us is that the people that we surround ourselves with in our lives, our companions, our friends, it's a very important decision who we choose to be in that inner circle because those people have great influence on us. And they can influence us in the direction of a wiser life or they can influence us in the direction of a foolish life and can end up leading to pain. And so we want to choose our friends wisely. And the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about the kind of friends that we want to look for, the kind of friends that we want to keep, the kind of friends that we want to be. And we are going to dive in and look at some of that this morning together. But before we do, I want to just get our hearts and our minds ready to be thinking about friends. And I want to do that by putting some, some real faces on the friendship in our lives. And I would like to start at the very beginning. The very beginning, all right? Would everyone in the room please just think back to who was your childhood best friend? Who was your first friend? I know we've got some kids in the room this morning, so you feel free to be thinking about this. Who's your best buddy? But the adults in the room, we might have to rewind a little bit further to remember our first childhood friend. You can even close your eyes if you want to imagine this person. Who was he? Who was she? What did he look like? You know, did he have red hair maybe and freckles? Did she have blonde bouncy curls or dark hair? What did you do together? What did you do together? Did you ride your bikes together in the cul-de-sac? Did you go fishing at the local pond? Did you play Barbies together or army men together? Or maybe Barbies versus army men. That would be an epic battle. Um, I, I wanted to show you a picture of, of one of my first friends. All right, this is, this is my, a picture of myself with my friend Katie Schefter. Now, we, you can laugh. It's fine. Go ahead. I look completely ridiculous. Uh, this is the earliest picture that I could find of, of Katie and I, but we actually became friends when I was seven and she was six. And we were in this singing group together, the Melody Lane Singers. We had awesome outfits. I mean, clearly, clearly. And the Melody Lane Singers, we did a lot of traveling together. We spent a lot of time. We logged a lot of hours on Greyhound buses and airplanes. And Katie and I would always sit next to each other. And we would take turns buying the bag of Starburst candies. Starburst candies are individually wrapped, you know. And so the game was that on the count of three, we would each put a wrapped Starburst into our mouth. And whoever could unwrap it first using just their teeth and their tongue and have the wrapper come out first was the winner. All right? It was a fun game. So basically, our friendship was like a permanent sugar high, right? All the way through, all the way through my childhood. Ryan um, had some childhood friends as well. And I thought I would just tell you about one of them this morning. Uh, who happens to have been imaginary. <laughs> this is an absolutely true story. Ryan did have an imaginary friend. 
I know that they played catch together, and I have no idea how that worked. But they played catch together. I know they read books together. That makes sense. You know, kids have, an, have imaginary friends. That's pretty common. What was a little uh, uncommon and extraordinary about Ryan's imaginary friend was that his imaginary friend's name was Debbie. <laughs> Debbie. I kid you not. So I had some competition, right, when I came into this relationship, because Debbie, I mean, she's everywhere, right? That's hardly fair. <laughs> That's hardly fair. All right, our childhood best friends, whether they are imaginary or real, they are really important people in our lives. They're the first people that we bond with, that we connect with, that we love outside of our nuclear family, and those are important people in our lives. Then we move into our young adult years, uh, junior high, high school, even into college, and most often we choose friends during this era of our lives kind of based on similar interests. Uh, we form sort of cliques, don't we? The volleyball friends and the basketball friends and the golf friends, tennis friends, cheerleading friends, whatever. We form these cliques, but we know from developmental psychologists, that the friends that we choose during this really formational era of our lives is an important decision, a really important decision, because the single greatest influence on the life of a teenager is not their parents anymore. It's not our school. It's his friends, right? It's his friends. And so we know we've got some teenagers in the room this morning, and I just hope you'll lean in on this part and just let this sink in. Those who walk with the wise become wise. A companion of fools can suffer great harm, and the friends that you choose in this formational season in your lives is an important decision. It's an important decision. As we move into adulthood, Sometimes we will hang on to a friend or two from our childhood, right? We'll, we'll bring them along with us. Annual and perennial are words that we use when it comes to plants. We have annual plants, perennial plants. We also have annual and perennial friends, right? We have annual friends who really are just in our lives for a season. They're planted once, they blossom, they bring us great joy in that season. But as the, as the season moves on, the friendship moves on. But then conversely, we have perennial friends that like perennial plants, they come back year after year after year, and we know that they're going to be with us for our lifetime. And I just thought I would show you a picture of Katie and I today. Uh, this picture was taken two weeks ago when I was home in Washington. Do you think I was excited to see her? Do you see the vein popping out of my neck? I am so happy to be with my dear, dear friend Katie. She's one of my perennial friends, and, they, and she's the kind of friend that we can go years without seeing one another, and um, we just pick right up where we left off. I'm thankful for my friends. We should all be thankful for our friends. We can thank God for our friends, the gift that they are in our lives. As we move into adulthood, um, very often a shift will occur in our friendship lives, whereas as, uh, friendship had a primary place in our lives as children. Sometimes when we become adults, we just get busy we get busy and we, and, we, and we don't prioritize our adult friendships. We, we, we push them to the margins in the back seat in our lives. You know, we may have dozens or even hundreds of Facebook friends, right? But looking at their pictures at 10 o'clock at night is not the same as logging face-to-face, side-by-side time with a friend. It's important that we do that. The book of Proverbs would tell us. That, that it's important we make time for friends. Not only does the book of Proverbs tell us this, but I, I came across an article that I thought was wonderful. Uh, it, it is an article that was written about a lecture that was given by a professor of psychiatry at Stanford University. I'm going to get his name right. His name is Dr. Alan Schatzberg. And Dr. Alan Schatzberg studied the mind-body connection of friendship. He studied the impact of friendship on our health, on our physical bodies. And here's the conclusion that he came to. He says, spending time with a friend is just as important to our general health as jogging or working out at the gym. Is that good news or is that good news? <laughs> right? An hour at Starbucks with a friend or an hour on an elliptical machine? I'm going with Starbucks. Okay. He actually goes on to say, he says it even, even more profoundly, failure he says, to create and maintain quality personal relationships, friendships with other humans is as dangerous to our physical health as smoking. As smoking. And I've heard that's pretty bad for you, okay? So the Proverbs and Stanford agree that friendship is really important in our lives. We neglect it to the detriment of our health. We neglect it to the detriment of living the wise life that God has called us and created us to live. And so now that we fully believe that, we are going to go back to our theme verse this morning. Those who walk with the wise become wise. In your bulletin, it says this, you are who you spend time with. 
You are who you spend time with, so you want to choose those people wisely. And the book of Proverbs has much to say to us about how we choose good friends, characteristics, qualities to look for in friends, characteristics and qualities that we want to be as friends. Now, there are dozens of, of Proverbs about friendship. Um, we can't possibly cover them all this morning, but they do all land. And basically, three major categories that we're going to look at together this morning. You are welcome to follow along in your Bibles, but you should also know that all the Bible references to these Proverbs are in your bulletin, and they will all be up on the screens, all right? So let's jump in. The first C, they're all going to begin with C because every good message has all their points that start with the same letter, right? I learned that from my husband. Okay. The first C of a Proverbs-based friendship is candor. Candor. It is very clear in the book of Proverbs that our truest friends are the friends who know us well. They know the good and the bad and the ugly. And they are not afraid to speak honestly with us when needed about the ugly in our lives. Proverbs 29.5 says, To flatter friends is to lay a trap for their feet. To flatter friends is to lay a trap for their feet. This proverb tells us that friends in our lives who do do nothing but flatter us are really not doing us any favors. In fact, they're laying a trap for our feet. Why would that be? Why would that be? Because none of us is perfect. All right? Newsflash. We knew that, right? We knew that. But it's amazing how many of us will only get close enough to a person that they would see our best side our good side, our shiny, got it all together, wise, intelligent, sophisticated, wonderful, charming side, right? But we don't let people sometimes in to see our imperfect, insecure, I actually don't have it all together side. But the book of Proverbs would tell us that our true friends are the ones who know us, our great qualities, and they love us for those great qualities, but they also know our not so great qualities, and they love us still. Not only do they love us still, but they are willing to speak candidly to us when needed. Your feet smell. Your feet smell. Uh, The way that you flirt with that man doesn't honor your husband. It doesn't honor your marriage. Um, Your work-life balance is really getting off. Your friends, I mean, excuse me, your friends and your family and your children, they need you more. They need you more. If a friend will not say those things to us, Who will? Who will, right? The next proverb tells us, uh, Proverbs 27, 6, that wounds from a sincere friend can be trusted. Wounds from a sincere friend can be trusted. They are better than many kisses from an enemy. A true friend can be honest with you, even if it wounds you a little bit. Even if it wounds you a little bit. Not to hurt you. The goal in a friendship is not to hurt you, but to help you. To say something that you need to hear so that you will not miss a blind spot, so that you will avoid some pain in your life and some pain in the people's lives around you. A good friend will wound us in that way. And then the last verse in this series is probably most familiar to us. It's iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. You know that you are with a true friend when that friendship causes you to become a better person. A better person, a sharper person better person. And this is entirely a mutual thing, right? This iron and sharpening iron. It's not a picture of one, one friend sharpening the other, right? That's, that's more of a mentoring relationship, honestly, and there's a place for that in our lives. But this is a friendship, and this is a very mutual sharpening. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. It's mutual challenge, mutual candor, mutual sharpening, mutual growth. We grow with a Proverbs friend. And so I ask you today, do you have friends in your life who challenge you? Do you have friends who can speak candidly to you? Do you have friends who know you well enough? Have you let them get near enough to you to know your ugly parts so that they could speak to you about those things? And are you a friend? Are you a friend who is willing to challenge your friends when needed? If you won't, who will? If you won't, who will? The first characteristic of a Proverbs friendship is candor. The next quality of a Proverbs uh, friendship brings a little needed balance to the first. The second quality of a Proverbs friend is care. Is care. In the book of Proverbs, it is very clear that our true friends are the ones who know how to care for us when life gets hard because life will get hard. 
and we will need our friends the most then. Our proverb for this one, I love it, is Proverbs 25, verse 20. Listen to this extremely, um, just vivid imagery. It says, singing cheerful songs to a person, a friend, with a heavy heart is like taking someone's coat in cold weather or pouring vinegar in their wound. All right, so we've got, uh, we've got singing cheerful songs over someone who has a heavy heart. Okay, so we've got friend one coming to friend two. Friend one has a heavy heart. Something, something happens, something's going on, and, and comes to friend two, and friend two says, oh, hi, friend one, how are you doing? And friend one says, well, actually not very well. Uh, my dog died. And friend two puts her hand on friend one's shoulder and says, the sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun. And then friend one punches friend two in the face. <laughs> right? I mean, that's almost what it says in the Bible. I mean, we think, what? Why would you do that? Your friend is sad and you are singing a cheerful song over them. How totally inappropriate, except that we do it all the time. We do it all the time. And can I be honest with you? I think we especially do this as Christians. I do. I think our theology is spot on. Our theology is spot on. We know that God can work for the good in all things. Even the most horrific and horrendous thing that your friend is going through, God can work for the good in all things. But you know what? Sometimes your friend doesn't need a sermon. Sometimes your friend doesn't need a song. Sometimes your friend just needs you to shut your mouth and comfort them. It says to do anything else. In this proverb, it says to do anything else is to remove their coat in the middle of winter. Right? They're in the middle of the winter of their soul. And as a friend, you, you slap on a tidy Bible verse or sing a cheerful song, and it's like you are taking off their coat in the middle of the wintertime, leaving them to feel more exposed, colder than they were when they came to you in the first place. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. And if that's not clear enough imagery, we get, we get this one. It says, to do so is to pour vinegar in the wound of your friend. And I just thought a phenomenal sermon illustration would be to, to bring Ryan up here. And, you know, just wound him a little bit. Just a little bit. A little flesh wound, right? Small. And then take some vinegar, pour it in the wound, and just see what happens. Right? Just see what happens. He wasn't up for it. I was so disappointed. But we can imagine what would have happened. It would have been highly entertaining, but so painful. So painful. I can't imagine doing that to him. I can't imagine doing that to him, but it's exactly what we do when we slap on our tidy Bible verses and sing our cheerful songs on our friends when they are in pain. Sometimes we just need to shut our mouths and do nothing but be a warm coat that our friend needs, the warm coat that our friends need. Do you have friends in your life who are able to be the warm coat for you when life gets hard? Because it will. And are you a person who is able to sit with a friend who is hurting and not try to fix it, but just be the warm coat that they need to weather this cold season? A Proverbs friend is a comforting friend. The last characteristic of a Proverbs friend is constancy. Constancy. Proverbs 18, verse 24 says, One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A Proverbs friend is a friend that sticks by us through the thick and the thin, through the good and the bad, like a brother would, like a sister would. And for this one, I want to uh, jump into a biblical story of friendship. King Solomon, we know, is the author of most of the Proverbs. King Solomon, we don't know a whole lot about friendship in his life, but we do have a beautiful window into the friendship that King Solomon's father, King David, shared with a man named Jonathan. And here's their story. It's found in 1 Samuel. David and, jo and Jonathan are teenage boys when they meet. Jo David is, is a shepherd boy at the time, and you might remember this story, David who slays the giant, Goliath, right? He has just slain the, the giant, uh, Goliath, and King Saul, the king at the time, says, I want to meet that boy. I want to meet that remarkable boy. Bring him to me. So David comes to King Saul's house, and King Saul meets David, and then it says that Jonathan, the son of King Saul, comes into the room and meets David. And it says that their connection is immediate. It's immediate. Do you have friendships like that? Do you have friendships like that? Like you meet and you just think, haven't we always been friends? We've always been friends, haven't we? Well, we're certainly going to be friends from now on, right? It's a kindred spirit, you might call. David and Jonathan are kindred spirits. They're immediate friends. 
And what happens from there is King Saul says, I want this boy moving into my household. He, I want to use him. So King David moves into the household. Jonathan and David have the opportunity to form a friendship. They train as warriors together, and they get to become best friends. Their friendship gets complicated when David begins to really rise in fame, rise in stature, rise in popularity. He's clearly going to become the next king, and King Saul is jealous. Ooh, he's jealous. He is jealous to the point of a visceral uh, hatred. He wants to kill David. In fact, he makes it his life mission to go after David, hunt him down, and kill him, which puts Jonathan in an interesting position between his father and his best friend. But somehow Jonathan is, is able to, to do this. He's able to not betray his father, but to use his proximity to his father, King Saul, to warn David of when and where to hide. He really saves his life. He saves his life. And we get to listen in on what becomes their final conversation. This is their final conversation because Jonathan is, is killed shortly after this meeting. He's killed in battle. And when they're having this conversation, they know that they are in a very precarious position. There are battles waging all around. And so this is how they leave each other. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, Jonathan says to David, May you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as we live. May you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as we live. He's asking David in a way for, for a pact, a friendship pact. He's saying, will you agree to be faithful to me for the rest of our lives as my friend? And David says, absolutely, I agree. And they do make this pact, and you can read about that story. But what I want to lean into here is the word that Jonathan uses right here for faithful love. He says, will you love me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live? The Hebrew word that is used there is the Hebrew word chesed, H-E-S-E-D, chesed. You kind of want to say it with me, don't you? You have to growl it a little bit. Ready? Chesed. All right. Chesed is one of these Hebrew words that is just thick with meaning. It actually has two meanings side by side. Chesed means loyalty and mercy. Loyalty and mercy. Loyalty. It, this is a love that is steadfast. This is a love that will hold still. When everything else is moving, this love will hold still. It is a steadfast love. But in order to have steadfast love, you must, in a relationship, have mercy. You must have mercy. Why? Because the subject of our love will always fail us. Always. Somewhere along the way, we are friends with imperfect people, and somewhere along the way, they're going to drop the ball. They're going to forget our birthday. They're going to hurt our feelings. They're going to disappoint us. They are going to walk through selfish seasons that make it difficult to be friends with them. They're going to fail us. But you know what? They're friends with an imperfect person, too. I am an imperfect person, too. I will drop the ball. Drop the ball. I will fail my friends. I will disappoint my friends. So in order for a friendship to have chesed, to be a steadfast friendship, there also must be mercy. There must be mercy. We can put it this way. This is in your bulletin. If there is to be a lifelong, loyal friendship with chesed, we will have to give each other the grace to grow. The grace to grow. Do you have a friend in your life who needs some grace to grow? Give them some grace do you maybe need some grace to grow? Ask your friend for that. I'm growing. David and Jonathan make a commitment that they will love each other this way, that they will be steadfast in their friendship. They will not move. When everything else is shifting, this friendship will hold still. But in order to have a friendship like that, you have to have mercy. And we want to notice that Jonathan and David were very clear on where the source of said love is. When Jonathan says to David, will you love me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live? Will you love me like God loves me? Hased is the word that is used over and over again in the Bible to describe the type of love, the kind of love that God has for his people. God loves his people, us, his friends, steadfastly with mercy, faithful and forgiving. 
And we know that God's faithful, forgiving love took him all the way to the cross where Jesus died on the cross for his friends. We can extend said love to our friends because we have received it first from Jesus. We've received it first from him. Our last proverb this morning is Proverbs uh, 20, verse 6. It was likely penned by Solomon, the son of King David, who had this Hased friendship with Jonathan. And it's a lament. It's a lament. Listen to this. It says, many will say they are loyal friends. And that's that word, Hased. Many will say that they are Hased friends. But who can find one who's truly reliable? Many will say that they will love you with Hased. I'll, I'll love you forever, right? BFF, here's my half of the heart necklace, Okay. Forever, right? But at the end of the day, how many people are really left standing? How many friends are really left standing? And of course, the answer is not very many. Not very many. Has said friendships take time. They take time. They take commitment. They take years. So we may not have very many friendships like this. In fact, it'd be a good idea to look to the example of Jesus, which is generally a good idea as a Christian. But Jesus had 12 friends. 12 buddies. You know, he had his posse of 12 disciples. But he was really only close with three. Really close with three. And that's probably a manageable number for most of us in the room. Three friends. These are not Facebook friends. These are friends that we make time for. Real time for real time for, so that we can get to know each other to the level where we know each other's great qualities, we also know each other's not so great qualities, and we can challenge each other with candor when needed. If a friend won't, who will? We want friends who can challenge us with candor. We want friends who know how to care for us when life gets hard, because it will. And we want to be able to have time to care for our friends when they are going through a hard time, because they will. And we want friends who there's somehow, explicit or implicit, a, a commitment to be constant for one another. The world around us will, will shift continually. But will you hold still? Will you hold still? And will you show me mercy? Wouldn't we each just be so blessed, so blessed, and just absolutely wiser, better people if we had one maybe two, God willing, three friends like this, Proverbs-based friends. The researchers tell us that without friends, we might as well smoke. Might as well smoke. The Bible tells us that those who walk with the wise become wise. So may we choose our friends carefully. Let's pray together this morning. Lord, we want to thank you this morning for our friends. All the way back to the beginning. Those first friends that we got to romp around and play with and learn how to love. Thank you for them. Thank you for the friends in our young adult years who taught us so much and helped us to become the people that we are. And thank you for the friends that we have today as adults and for the opportunity that we have to share your love with one another. God, it is your love that is the foundation of our friendships. We can extend steadfast love and forgiveness to our friends because you have extended those things to us. This morning, God, as we celebrate the last meal that you shared with your friends, we pause to remember and to say thank you for the friendship that you offer us. It is a friendship that is always closer than a brother. A friendship that laid down its life for us. We thank you for that this morning. We remember you this morning. Our dear, dear friend Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm standing here thinking uh, that I'm glad you got to spend some time with my best friend this morning, and I'm not talking about Debbie, okay, all right, <laughs> never going to hear the end of that, 
I was also thinking about something that Jen said, that um, our friends, no matter how good of friends they are, will always, you know, disappoint us along the way. And there's only one who will never disappoint us. There's only one friend who will never let us down. And that's why it's perfect that today as we talk about friendship, we're celebrating communion. Jesus said this, he said, greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus isn't just one who talks the talk, he, he walks the walk. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, what a friend we have in you, that you would lay down your life for us and call us friends, God. We, um, we find in you the perfect friend, the friend that will never let us down, that will speak those words of comfort and candor and Lord, we'll provide everything that we need in life, and uh, you are walking with us every step. Some people in the room today just need to know that you are their faithful and forever friend, Lord Jesus. And it's out of the friendship that we have with you, God, as we heard today, that we can begin to have friends that go beyond the surface, that go beyond online, that, that friendships that, that will last said friendships, Lord. So would you bring those friendships uh, into our lives, God? Would you help us to be the types of friends that are loyal and merciful? Lord, I just sense that in this room today, there are some friendships that need to be mended. Or forgiveness and healing, Lord, is waiting. And so would you stir up in us courage and conviction to re-engage those friendships, Lord, those perennial friendships that are waiting for us to, to have year after year after year. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that makes all of this possible, and we pray the prayer now that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Just a reminder, as always, we have our prayer ministers up front ready to pray with you or in the prayer chapel. This might be a good day to receive some prayer for those relationships in your lives or anything that you want prayer for. But before you go, would you stand so you can receive the blessing that God has for you? God wants to bless you, and so hear these ancient words of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week for Kids Matter. Have a great week.